Good morning. I'm Peter Thomas, Executive Director of the Marine Mammal Commission. The Commission is pleased to sponsor this Margaret Davidson Emerging Leader Session of Chow, which focuses on new perspectives on conserving nature. What does biodiversity loss mean for us, and what actions can we take to turn the trajectory around? The Commission was founded in 1972 when Congress passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Among the host of visionary environmental statutes enacted in that important era, the MMPA incorporated the concept of restoring and maintaining marine mammal populations as functioning elements of their ecosystems. A primary objective is to maintain the health and stability of marine ecosystems. Congress charged the Commission with providing science-based oversight of domestic and international policies and actions which address human impacts on marine mammals and their ecosystems. Today, we are working to address threats to marine mammals such as fisheries entanglement and disturbance from offshore energy development and understand the consequences of widespread environmental change on marine mammals. Our work ranges from Alaska and Hawaii to the Gulf of Mexico and New England, and reflecting the international vision of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, further afield to endangered freshwater dolphins in the Mekong River in Cambodia, marine mammal entangling tuna fisheries in the Indian Ocean, and to international efforts such as ensuring the global ocean observing system adequately accommodates the biological information so important to management decisions. We're very grateful for the vision embodied in early species conservation laws. Visionaries like Tom Lovejoy carried forth the focus on species and then ecosystem protection to recognize the more encompassing need to study and conserve biological diversity, the variety of life on Earth, on behalf of the health of the entire planet. One thing about vision, new vision is always needed. Today, we'll hear from a panel of emerging leaders on why we need to conserve a variety of life on Earth, our role in stewardship of nature, and the integration of biodiversity protection into our economy. How can we elevate underrepresented communities and bring their voices and leadership to bear in creating a more sustainable and equitable future? What efforts are underway to explore and map biodiversity, including through genetics, and to scale up biodiversity observing networks to the global level? How are satellites, big data, and machine learning helping us understand and manage fisheries? And how can we harness the circular economy and consumer preferences to support coastal health? <clears throat> Along with our panel of leaders in marine science, we welcome two representatives who have shown their commitment to marine conservation through their service on the House Committee on Natural Resources, the Honorable Raul Grijalva and the Honorable Joe Cunningham. Thank you, and we look forward to the session. Thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts on biodiversity with you on the Capitol Hills Oceans Week. Biodiversity is so important to us humans as a species. We depend on nature and it's our responsibility to protect it in return. Biodiversity offers so much, especially in the oceans, where balanced ecosystems will only become more important as the climate crisis increases. We need to protect our marine biodiversity because all ocean species have a role to play in those ecosystems. Those systems that feed us, protect our shores from hurricanes and sea level rise, and produce the oxygen we breathe. The loss of biodiversity occurring today is a systemic problem that stems from our exploitation of the earth, from fossil fuel extraction to habitat destruction to plastic pollution and much more. As chair of the House Natural Resources Committee, I've made it one of my top priorities to protect biodiversity by upholding the Endangered Species Act, the best law on the books for stopping extinction. Since the 1970s, the Endangered Species Act has prevented the extinction of 99% of the species listed. Despite this great track record, it continues to be under attack by the Trump administration, and we are doing all we can to protect and keep that law intact. I greatly appreciate all the work ocean scientists and activists like you are doing to protect our oceans and our biodiversity on Earth. If we all put our heads together, we can stop extinction now and save our oceans. In these troubling and difficult times, now more than ever, 
your work and the effort to protect our biodiversity, our oceans, is critical to the well-being and the survival of all species, including ours. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ocean Week 2020. I want to thank the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation for organizing this event and for all of their work to protect biodiversity and build a sustainable global economy that works for everyone. These issues are personal to me and the district that I represent. Healthy oceans are the lifeblood of my local economy. And last year, I led the effort to pass H.R. 1941, the Coastal and Marine Economies Protection Act, a bill that would stop new offshore drilling lease sales from developing along the Atlantic and the Pacific Coast. This bill had wide bipartisan support because folks from both sides of the aisle recognized that environmental conservation is not a partisan issue. A major disaster off our coast, like the Deepwater Horizon spill, would be devastating to coastal communities. And even in the absence of a huge blowout, chronic pollution from everyday operations and the small spills would forever change the character of our coast for the worse. Our oceans are already threatened by the impacts of warming temperatures, ocean acidification, and climate change. We must preserve and protect them from further development that jeopardize their well-being and in turn, the security of our coastal economy. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We merely borrow it from our children. God bless you all, and God bless our ocean. Welcome to Capitol Hill Ocean Week 2020. My name is Chris Seary. I'm the CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. And I'm very excited to moderate this panel today. It's called the Margaret Davidson Merging Leader Panel. And we have a great group of speakers today to, to address the issue of biodiversity. For those of you who don't know Margaret Davidson, she worked at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and was a true leader. She was somebody who supported emerging leaders in their career and always celebrated innovation and new ideas as ways to help us address climate change and ocean conservation. This panel today really reflects the spirit that is Margaret Davidson. They are a great group of leaders who have a diversity of backgrounds, but they will share one common issue, and that is how do we go about measuring biodiversity, managing our oceans for biodiversity, and engage people in that decision-making and management. So they all come from very different angles, but they share that common thread in terms of their work. I'm going to take time to uh, introduce you just very briefly to each of the panelists, turn it over to them for their presentation, and then we're going to engage in a discussion um, across the, the group. So first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ani Durhas. Um, and Ani is working very hard to look at how we can measure marine biodiversity using different techniques and tools in order to really help us understand the diversity of life in our ocean and then from that use it as a management tool. So Ani, I'll turn it over to you. As Chris said, my name is, uh, is Ani Drews. I am uh, currently an assistant professor at the University of the Faroe Islands. Um, I was born and raised on the Faroes, so it was a uh, a very natural way for me to kind of get interested in the marine environment because I don't know what you guys know about the Faroe Islands, but it's a tiny speck of land in the middle of the ocean uh, surrounded with marine environment that that is a very appealing and of course attractive way to kind of get uh, get used to that sort of habitat. And uh, while I was studying my bachelor's also at the University of the Faroe Islands, where, which is where I'm now based, I learned a lot about biodiversity and I learned a lot about the smallest participants um, when looking at biodiversity, namely the microorganisms. And I realized at the time that there was very little information that we actually knew about microorganisms. So I already then started kind of focusing on figuring out more information about even which microorganisms were where and, and what they do and what the diversity of them are. Um, and I think kind of as a part of that and the technological advancements that were happening at the time, it really helped me kind of integrate my microbial perspective with, um, with larger animals and other trophic levels, such as 
as the plants or the smaller animals or fish that eat those animals and, and go into whales and mammals. Uh, and I was able to kind of integrate that and, uh, and then as a part of, um, of my kind of further education and my postdoc, I was, uh, uh, was a part of the MBON team, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network team, where I was mainly in charge of developing these methods and developing ways to integrate these data sets to measure uh, total biodiversity. And this is all done using genetic materials that is floating around in the ocean that we then pick up using a very, very small filter uh, that will, will filter or keep all of the DNA from these organisms all the way from the smallest pieces being bacteria to the largest animals being whales or, or seals. So we get to retain all of that genetic information and then look at all of these at the same time. So what I think is very important when observing biodiversity is that we kind of expand and help develop ways to measure uh, the total biodiversity and maybe not focus on specific species or groups of organisms. Um, and I think it's very important that we actually manage to measure all of these different trophic levels or groups simultaneously. Um, and if we're able, or if we're gonna wanna be able to actually look at some environmental change or just seasonal change for that matter, it's very important that we start developing and establishing time series. And I think that all of these things are actually very possible if we can get networks of people together and organizations working closely together, actually making these measurements um, and that way we can address very important issues that are facing us in the future, such as pollution, uh, plastic pollution and climate change that are all affecting biodiversity and the, the different animals in the world. And so I really hope that kind of with this technological development, we'll be able to integrate different parts and different types of, of scientists uh, to come together to actually address these larger issues. Uh, I think that was me, thank you. Ani, thank you very much. That was great. Now we're gonna hear a slightly different perspective. Next, we're gonna hear from Megan Morikawa. And Megan has a really fascinating background. Megan has trained as a marine uh, biologist, but now she works for the Oberstar Group, which is a luxury hotel line who is embracing how you bring marine conservation into the work that they're doing. So she's crossed over into the corporate world and what is an incredibly important partner as we try to figure out how we bring ocean conservation into our corporate boardroom and have that made part of the decision making. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Megan. Thanks so much, Chris. So uh, as she was saying, my name is Dr. Megan Morikawa and I have somehow found myself to be the director of the Global Director of Sustainability at Iberostar Group. I'm gonna tell you what Iberostar is, where I was a couple of years ago and how it is that we got here and why I think that this sort of collaboration is actually a really interesting way to do surprisingly needed science in new settings. Um, but also to, uh, uh, to protect biodiversity, um, but also need scientists like all of our viewers listening in order to fill the increasing appetite for ways that the private sector can help us to contribute to some of those solutions. Um, so as Chris was saying, Iberostar Group is a hotel chain. We are a Spanish-based family-owned company. There's 120 hotels, 19 countries around the world, 32,000 employees, 8 million guests, and 80% of those hotels are coastal. They're beachfront. They're in places that fundamentally are linked to the ocean and to the ecosystems that protect those businesses, those employees, those communities, and all of us um, to be able to continue uh, in uh, having people come and learn and experience these new destinations. Um, I think what I was not expecting was to be leading a team of 12 scientists in our wave of change movement, where we're moving beyond single-use plastics and towards a circular economy. We have a commitment to a responsible consumption of seafood and in uh, the discovery, protection, and restoration of the coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrasses that surround those properties in our coastal health work. But two years ago, I was finishing up my PhD at Stanford looking at how it is that we could restore coral reefs that were more resilient to climate change. 
And I was doing that actually with uh, genetic techniques as well. So I'm, I'm excited to talk with Annie more about some of the work that uh, she is doing. But what I think is really fundamental was the moment when Gloria Flusha, who's the uh, fourth generation ownership of this hotel chain, walked into the room uh, at Stanford and sat down with my professor and I and asked us a couple of questions. And it took all of five questions for me to be convinced that the private sector could have really interesting solutions for scale that perhaps we were limited in our capacity to discover and implement in academia. First question, she sat down and said, look, I don't want pretty pictures. I'm not here to greenwash. I'm here to understand how our business can best help the oceans. What are the options, right? So we talked about coral reef restoration and some of the challenges around that. And I think when you actually get into the field of what it takes to restore reefs, you see that there are a lot of complications and a lot of barriers to scale very quickly. And by the fifth question, she asks us, as a businesswoman, okay, so what are the barriers to scaling reef restoration around the world? And I looked at my advisor and I looked at her and I said, you know, that sounds like an obvious question, but it took us 12 years to figure out in the field that scale and this sort of mentality was what we needed to apply. Fast forward a couple years into the future, we're now using science-based targets and the science team in order to get there. And we've created what we call our uh, long-term agenda to 2030 to align with the UN SDG goals, where our first goal is we commit to being free of single-use plastics in all of our properties. We are the first hotel chain to have no single-use plastics in all of our rooms um, in operation. Uh, and we will be free of single-use plastics in our, all of our operations by 2020, the end of this year. Uh, waste free, as in sending nothing to landfill by 2025, and carbon neutral uh, by 2030 with mangroves and the protection and restoration of those ecosystems as a really critical part of how we offset carbon in order to achieve that goal. Our second goal is to be 100% responsible in the sourcing of our seafood. Um, while that sounds simple uh, to begin with, it's actually incredibly complex for one of our world's wild, last wild wild har harvests with thousands of species in consumption. We're actually launching a roadmap um, because transparency and pathways for others to follow is really important to, to us. This roadmap on how we will achieve this work will be announced on World Oceans Day. Um, or is announced on World Oceans Day. Um, and then we also, our third goal is that all ecosystems are in improving ecological health alongside profitable tourism by 2030. And if you're an ecologist or someone who's passionate about biodiversity, I think it's easy to know that that's a really hard goal to set. Um, and that metrics and indicators for what ecosystem health should be and how that can improve throughout time are all things that uh, my colleagues here are working on. And it's a real demonstration of why we need these public-private partnerships in order to build the tools that allow us to actually implement them to multiply the impact of uh, marine protection. Megan, thank you very much. So I'm going to be interested in kind of coming back and talking about the science to management um, conversation and how we bridge that, that particular gap. So next I want to introduce Juan Mayorga. And I met Juan earlier this year, but I had actually heard about his work about a year ago, which is truly fascinating. Um, you know, he's going to talk about this, but it was about how we actually try to prioritize areas in our very large ocean for marine uh, protection. And he's done some amazing data analysis in order to help kind of look at those trade-offs and those benefits. So with that, let me turn it over to Juan. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, so I, I currently describe myself as a marine data scientist. And uh, so most of you may have never heard that term before, but all that means is that I am good at wrangling and analyzing and visualizing uh, large amounts of ocean related data, uh, such as animal tracks or ocean temperature or the activity of fishing vessels around the world. Uh, but most importantly, I combine data science with economic theory and marine ecology uh, to try and get novel and actionable insights that can help us improve uh, the way we manage and protect our oceans. Um, so now I said I'm currently a data scientist and the reason I say that is because I have not always been and I think I may not always be. Um, I was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia and I did my undergraduate degree in engineering with, with minors in biology and business management. Um, then I moved to the United States and did a master's in environmental science and specialized in coastal resources management. And along this very winding path, I have become 
just a firm believer that we really have to um, embrace uh, interdisciplinarity and stay nimble and adaptable if we want to have a great, uh, want to make a great contribution to to whatever cause that we are really passionate about. Um, so I currently work at the Environmental Market Solutions Lab uh, at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And I'm also part of a National Geographic's Pristine Seas Project, which is an initiative to help protect the last wild places in the ocean. And we do that by combining um, science with economics, with very compelling media, and with policy and diplomacy. And my work in the last five years or so uh, has focused on leveraging the very rapid increase in ocean data that we are currently seeing uh, to catalyze ocean science and conservation. Uh, we really are in the middle of a technology and data revolution uh, and you know, a growing network of sensing in instruments from satellites, um, all the, uh, from satellites to autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, and if you combine that with unprecedented computer power that we have today and sophisticated uh, data analysis models and techniques. Uh, that combination is allowing us to observe and really understand our ocean like, like never before. Um, so for example, thanks to groups uh, like Global Fishing Watch or uh, platforms like Global Fishing Watch, uh, we can now monitor and track fishing vessels in near real time with unprecedented resolution. And best of all, it's freely accessible for researchers and for the public uh, to use. And, this data has really been a game changer because we can now see uh, the who and the when and the where of industrial fishing fleets. And this can help us under, understand better uh, the spatial and temporal patterns of fishing, uh, investigate why humans behave the way they do at sea, um, refine our understanding of what are the impacts on marine biodiversity from fishing activities, and also help us evaluate the effectiveness of different management interventions or management policies. And uh, crucially for our work with Pristine Seas, um, this data is allowing us to transparently, transparently estimate uh, what are the economic implications, the benefits and the costs of creating protected areas and what those might be for local fisheries. And as we have you know, more diverse and larger data sets, we also have great opportunities to innovate and think differently. Uh, and for the past two years, I have been leading a group of, of experts um, to develop a novel conservation planning, planning framework for the ocean. This is what Chris was referring to when she kindly introduced me. And we, so we have been working on combining several data sources for, from different types of sensors and different types of groups um, to find the best places in the ocean uh, to create marine protected areas. So places that are off limits to uh, industrial extractive activities and destructive practices uh, for the benefit of biodiversity. And we define this biodiversity benefit um, in, a, in a more comprehensive way that had been uh, defined before, instead of just looking at the number of species, we're also looking at the functions of those species within their ecosystems and ensuring that those functions will remain. We're also looking at the evolutionary distinctiveness to try to preserve uh, the evolutionary tree uh, of marine life. And it's also not only about biodiversity, we're also, marine protected areas can also help replenish fisheries and actually increase catch. Uh, we think of marine protected areas um, that are uh, properly monitored and properly enforced as kind of like savings accounts. And, and um, the interests are what we, what we, what fisheries can then can then benefit from. Um, so, protect uh, fish get bigger, bigger, bigger within protected areas, uh, and then as they get bigger, they produce disproportionately more, more uh, larvae, and that larvae also helps replenish the fishery. So, we also look for places where are the best places in the ocean where, if we put a protected area, we can really help fisheries. And then the third objective that we looked at is carbon. So as many of you might be aware, the ocean is, is one of our best allies to, to uh, sequester carbon. And a lot of that carbon goes into the ocean sediment. So by, protect, so by protecting um, the ocean from extractive and destructive activities, we can protect and safeguard that carbon there uh, and prevent further remineralization and eventual carbon emissions. 
Um, so the rationale for unifying these objectives into one uh, harmonized conservation planning net, uh, framework is that we can no longer think of biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis as completely separate issues. And we have also to break that apparent divide between uh, protecting more of the ocean in one hand and continue to producing food to feed the world in the other, because there really shouldn't be one. We can, we can do both. Um, so these are really exciting times to be working in this field. And I'm really happy uh, to be having this conversation uh, with you all today. Juan, thank you very much. Um, I'm, 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 I'm just going to start up and pause and say how excited I am about this panel, just because based on the three introductions, it is incredible the amount of interdisciplinary work that's going on. And I know that's going to continue with it, but it is, it is great to learn and hear that this is not just about science and then science turning it over to somebody to make a decision. You guys are combining that all together um, to really have an impact. It's truly amazing. Amazing, sorry, crazy. Crazy and amazing. So anyways, next I want to introduce uh, Shana Edberg, who is the Director of Conservation Programs at Hispanic Access uh, Foundation. And uh, Shana, I know that this is a relatively new position um, for you, but what's really key here is you're on the side of how do we make that connection between the natural world and people and foster that stewardship. So I'm very excited that you're here to talk to us today, and I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about that with your passion about it and um, how we try to do that. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Bienvenidos a todos. Um, my name is Shauna Edberg, and I'm, like she said, I'm the Director of Conservation Programs at Hispanic Access Foundation. Um, and today I want to talk about the importance of human diversity when it comes to ocean conservation. Um, I was lucky enough to grow up close to the ocean in suburban Los Angeles. Um, and whenever I visited my grandparents in San Diego, all I ever wanted to do was spend time on the beach. Um, the ocean always had a really strong pull for me that I didn't understand, um, but I now recognize that nature in general and the ocean in particular represent for me everything that I want out of my life. Uh, freedom, adventure, beauty, mystery, interconnectedness. Um, and on a personal note, I'm Jewish, and growing up in Sunday school, they drilled this quote from the sage Hillel into us. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, who am I? And if not now, when? Between this and the Jewish idea of tikkun olam, or repairing the world, uh, you know, leaving your campsite in a better state than you found it, um, I grew up believing that I just can't stand idly by as the communities and ecosystems and the nature and the ocean that I love are threatened by things like climate change and pollution. Um, I was also born on the holiday of Tu B'Shvat, uh, what we call the, the birthday of the trees or Jewish Arbor Day. So clearly this was a love affair with nature that was just meant to be. Um, over the years, I have become increasingly convinced that there's no separation between uh, human systems and natural systems. There's no throwing anything away and everything that we do comes back to us like plastics and mercury that end up in the fish we eat. So we, when we put poison into the air and into the ocean, we end up poisoning ourselves. And now with the pandemic, we are seeing the result of that poisoning in the most vulnerable and discriminated among us. So to me, the fight for the equity of marginalized communities and the fight to protect the ocean are facets of the same struggle. Um, so it is really imperative, I think, to engage those who are the most vulnerable to climate and environmental hazards. Um, and those are also usually the same people who have the strongest beliefs on protecting nature and protecting the ocean. Um, so that's why I'm here today, uh, trying to repair my little slice of the world um, and advance Latino equity and protect ocean biodiversity at Hispanic Access Foundation. Um, to tell you a little bit about our conservation program, we work to engage the Latino community to, to become stewards of the land and ocean and to create new Latino conservation leaders with the resources they need to be effective and the political power to be heard when it comes to environmental decision making. And one way we do that is with initiatives like Latino Conservation Week, uh, which is coming up on July 18th through 26th. 
and we encourage everyone here listening and all your friends and colleagues to organize an outdoor or ocean themed event uh, that engages the Latino community. Um, and we do expect that most events will be digital or at home this year, but don't let that stop you. Um, we also produce resources like our just released white paper highlighting the Latino connection to the ocean and coast. Um, it's the first white paper of its kind. It has incredible data and stories of personal connections to the ocean and all the Latino heritage that is present on the ocean and coast plus the work that still needs to be done in making and using these connections uh, to protect the ocean and all its amazing biodiversity. Um, these are stories and voices that really need to be heard. So uh, please contact me if you're interested in reading it. Um, thank you for listening today. Muchas gracias. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. Hey, Shanna, thank you so much. Dr. Aaron Satherwhite is our last speaker um, before we go into discussion. And Erin has a fascinating background. She's very interested in terms of the taking science involving people and tying it to policy and decision making. So with that, let me turn it over to Erin. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be able to virtually connect with you all. And thanks, Chris, for the very warm welcome. Um, I'm Erin Satterthwaite, and I am currently a marine ecologist with the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in Future Earth. And in this role, I've been working very closely with the Global Ocean Observing Systems Biology and Ecosystems Panel, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, and within the context of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And so these organizations for me have been foundational to my journey towards realizing the power of biodiversity observations for a sustainable future. And that's the journey I'd like to briefly share with you today. And so my own journey begins as an observer. As a child, I would ride out onto the endless expanse of water, unaware of the array of life swimming below. And then when I got older and went fishing with my dad, I realized there existed a new relatively unexplored world below the seemingly one dimensional surface. And I was captivated by this variety of bizarre fish that we pulled up for dinner. So this fishing is what fueled my desire to peek beneath the surface. And I can still remember the first time I descended into my local kelp forest. There was light that was dancing through the fronds and this mesmerizing kaleidoscope of life unfolded before my eyes. And then as I returned to these same areas time and time again, I witnessed the gradual diminishment of this fundamental biodiversity. The kelp forest that I knew so well became carpeted with pokey purple pin cushions and began disappearing, and the red abalone fishery closed. And so with this starting point and then my subsequent training in ecology, I began to see this complex net of natural and social systems that were rapidly changing as humans became increasingly disconnected from these foundational connections. And so the remedy that I saw was moving toward a renewed interconnected wisdom. So these foundational observations can provide the essential knowledge that supports this wisdom. And so through my experiences, I saw that sustained, integrated, and inclusive biodiversity observations honor the complexity that's inherent in linked social and ecological systems. And they allow people to connect with the natural world and provide this necessary knowledge to inform wise decisions, which thereby support a sustainable future. And so to understand issues such as climate change, like Juan was talking about, and adaptively make decisions, we need this consistently collected and long-term observation. And these can come from things like observing programs and traditional and local knowledge. And then in order to build a more holistic knowledge of the complex systems that we're embedded in, these observations should be integrated across disciplines, this interdisciplinary uh, that Chris was talking about. So this is from physical to natural to social sciences, and as Ani mentioned, and then synthesized around the world. And so this requires extensive data management and relationship building between very disparate people who can align their diverse objectives under common frameworks. 
So things like the essential ocean and biodiversity variables and the UN ocean decade. And so ultimately our observation collecting then needs to build bridges to these local communities across sectors of society and across generations to generate the wisdom that's needed for this resilient and sustainable future. And I really think that moving people toward this reconnection, both with nature and our fellow humans, ensures a more system approach to decision making. And so I really think that this will include things like participatory and citizen science efforts, community based observing programs and the engagement of diverse stakeholders. And so in closing, I'm really inspired by the power of sustained, integrated, and inclusive observations to move us toward the holistic, integrated wisdom that we need for this long-term sustainability. And I'm excited to share that experience with others. And so thank you for listening to my story, and I'm really excited to chat with the rest of the panel and reach out if you'd like to connect. Thank you again. Erin, thank you very much. So the, uh, the first question I wanna have us kind of discuss is the issue around biodiversity. I think all, everybody in this group um, really believe in the importance of protecting biodiversity. Um, but I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding that concept and figuring out what it is that they can actually do to play a meaningful role. So just from your perspective, what do you think, what have we gotten wrong with trying to explain biodiversity to people and its importance to, to communities, um, both the human communities and our wildlife communities? So, why don't you just get your guys' thoughts about what have we gotten wrong and what's the one thing that you would want to try to change going forward for us to be better at explaining and being better stewards? I'm just going to look at someone. Megan, what, you want to try to take that, tackle that one? Sure. I think um, one of the things that uh, uh, all of our stories have is this intrinsic connection to the ocean. And I think what is a really important part of that connection is to one, recognize that we are always connected to the ocean, whether or not we are living next to it or not, right? Everything from every second breath comes from the ocean, but also the incredible intrinsic value of our oceans and the medicinal and biodiversity, uh, the values that biodiversity itself gives to us. Um, and I think one of the things that we have gotten wrong is uh, a little bit of, of not daring to go below the surface when we've been able to interact with these sorts of, of places. I think this is something that um, we as a tourism group are, are also trying to move beyond because we have a product that's about lying on the beach, right? And it's about being very, very, very close to this incredible resource that's giving back to your vacation, that's giving back to you no matter where you are in the world. And if you only just take a dip below that surface and understand the life, the reefs, the mangroves, the seagrasses, the incredible diversity that is present but declining in a lot of those regions, you can build that connection. This is not something that is only for those who visit these places, but those who live there. We uh, built in one of our facilities um, to kind of really integrate the, the science and all that we do, an actual coral lab facility where for the first time, many of our 6,000 employees who were born and raised in the Dominican Republic saw a live coral for the first time in their life. Um, and I think that being able to break that surface and go below that surface is one of the areas that we can really um, think about more innovative technical uh, solutions, but also just stories and connections to be able to make sure we all understand the connectivity of this incredible resource and its uh, fundamental um, importance in our livelihoods. Great. Erin, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to follow up on what Megan said and thinking about that understanding the connectivity, because to me, one of the challenges is the inherent complexity, this very complex system of interconnected relationships between within nature, but also between people and nature and between other people. And so I think that I really, that Megan, that resonates with me for sure, because that I think in a lot of ways, the only way to 
communicate complexity is to have these more holistic experiences with them. I think it's in a lot of cases, not just enough to rationally understand, but it has to be fully integrated and felt. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that because that, that definitely resonates with me. Juan, I think you wanted to say something too. Yeah, no, I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with both of you. I think uh, us as, as scientists and science communicators, we often perhaps get too bogged down on trying to explain the complexity of biodiversity. You know, it, it really is a lot more complex than just, just a number of species in a particular place at a particular time. Uh, but I think that, you know, most people don't need to understand the, in, the complexity of biodiversity as long as they realize the interconnectedness. And, and when, when, I, when I, I, like, I like to talk about, uh, I like to look, refer to us like people and nature because we are part of nature. It's all one thing. I don't think that we should really be talking about people and nature as separate things. And um, so I think our role as scientists and science communicators and uh, activists, conservationists, is to try to really um, tell people in a diversity of ways um, just, just how interconnected we really are. Like take, take for example, the, the current cri uh, ep epidemic. I mean, that, that, the, the root cause of that is it's really our broken relationship with nature. And we're taking so many things for granted uh, that comes from biodiversity, from a, from a, a rich um, biodiverse um, planetary ecosystem that we just need to hammer that message home as much as we can. And I think currently we have a great opportunity to do that. Honey. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Juan. And I guess further to that point, uh, I was thinking about what Megan was just saying that every other breath comes from the ocean, right? It's from oxygen produced by microorganisms that live in the ocean. Um, and so I, I think somehow for myself, or, or one of the things that really uh, was striking to me when I started my career was, was how underappreciated all the small things are and how unintegrated the information is that we know about them is with all the larger things and and really how to measure biodiversity is is really a challenge it's really hard it's not very easy and you just go out and count different things and that's the measurement that you get it's actually a lot more complex than that and i completely agree with juan with that um, i don't think that everyone needs to understand the importance of biodiversity uh or the uh, the intricacies and complexities about measuring biodiversity to understand the importance. I think that you can explain to people how important it is without explaining all the all the nitty-gritty things, but from my perspective um, to actually being able to integrate all of the, the smaller parts that you cannot see with your eyes when you go out um, into the ocean or into the habitat of, of all of these extraordinary organisms is is very, it's, it's a very important issue, I think, for challenging future biodiversity measurements. Um, and there's no way of actually knowing uh, without measuring the, the biodiversity of all of these other organisms also of how, how actually climate change or pollution can affect things like oxygen levels in the atmosphere. So I think it will become a more and more relevant issue kind of covering the whole spectrum of biodiversity kind of going forward because like integration into climate change is it's not two different things anymore like Juan mentioned it's it's an integrated world at this point because it's so interconnected so yeah I think that that will become or hopefully will be more integrated into these kinds of observations. Great thanks Annie. Shana? Um, I want to add on to what everyone else has said uh, but that you know it's not just a matter of explaining, but that showing and experiencing is a huge part of that. Um, you can meet people where they're at, which may be their last visit to the aquarium or their last family trip to the beach. Because I think when people experience um, these, these landscapes and these ecosystems, you know, they're filled with an, a natural wonder and you have to make that connection not just to the science but also to their lived experience and how they feel about all those things that they're seeing. 
Absolutely agree. Let me, I just wanna explore this theme a little bit um, more because uh, it's, it's, as you're saying, it's, it's about telling people to, the, the crisis that we kind of face right now on a global level from um, biodiversity uh, issues and also the climate side of the equation really disproportionately impacts lower income um, people, um, communities that often experience in, injustice. And I, I'm really interested to hear from this group. And you think about diversity and inclusion and how you try to think about um, engaging people to be part of that discussion where it, it impacts them. And so how do you look at diversity and inclusion in terms of the work that you're, you're trying to do right now? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. And I had a, one last comment about the, the previous question. And so my, my previous comment is, I think we also as scientists sometimes are, are guilty of preaching to the choir and really like use all only communicating to the people that are already agree with us and are already part of our of our circle. So I think we there's a lot of untapped communities so like religious leaders, uh, um, ethnic groups that that just have have been really untapped uh, as of now. So we really need to start diversifying our audiences when we speak about the importance of biodiversity. Um, and yes, it relates with equity. And I think uh, Shoshana made a great, great in point in her introduction about this and social justice. Uh, I think it's critical that uh, uh, marginalized communities, for example, we work a lot with indigenous communities currently in Chile, uh, helping them try to secure the rights to their traditional ancestral uh, waters from uh, intrusion from uh, salmon aquaculture, for example. I think, uh, again, tapping into those communities is extremely, extremely important. Uh, it's something that has been ignored and we can no longer afford to do that uh, for many reasons, social, economic, uh, but also ecological and for biodiversity's sake. Shana, do you wanna pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, from a purely practical perspective, if you want to get more people into your movement to protect the ocean, then you have to listen to their needs and find out what they want and expect from a clean ocean. And, you know, maybe that's um, fewer fishing advisories, maybe that's better information, um, maybe that's more beach access, but um, yet it, if we want to succeed, then we need more people to bring more people into our movement. And to do that, that requires this diversity of voices and, and listening to, to their needs. Megan, I think you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, um, one of the most, what has best prepared me to be able to do a, a job that is intended to scale solutions across a wide geography was actually to dive deeply into one of those geographies. And when I lived for a year in the Dominican Republic, in the complex alongside our employees that were facing and living with these ecosystems that perhaps some of them never even had heard of what a coral was in the Caribbean, right? Um, I think for me, it was a real realization that especially as a private business, which I really hope that private business will continue to engage and look for opportunities to increase their capacity capacity to work towards these common goals for everyone, that there's a really important set of trust building that needs to happen to understand and empathize what all of our communities are facing and have been facing, um, perhaps because these are, are topics that we're, we're in many cases just now understanding not only how complex they are, but potentially what some of the solutions are. We're working to uh, co-establish a marine sanctuary, a fish sanctuary in front of our hotel in Jamaica. And there, there's a fishing community that has lived there for a decade um, that is subsisting on this area. And we have an incredible moderating organization. So I think that's another important component as well, is that sometimes you do need moderators who can help to, uh, to, to empathize with that conversation that are the um, Orca Vesa Foundation. And they did themselves work with a fishing community just a few miles down the way to create a fish sanctuary, which as Juan was saying too, when you protect these areas from the thing that you're trying to recover, right from fishing you actually find that you can do fishing better in the long run if it's done in the correct sort of manner um, but it's really hard to have that conversation with these communities that um, 
that don't necessarily understand that relationship because how could you understand that relationship? It's a very complex one to understand, but also um, have, have needs that are at a subsistence level that absolutely have to be addressed in order to really make progress. And so I think that understanding is also a really, really important part of making sure that we can build these solutions that are tailored for every location. For me, that was the, the, the lesson learned is that to scale requires a deep dive in every single location and a different solution. And the real power is when you find the commonalities across those solutions that allow you to replicate them over and over again. Thank you. And Sean, I know you wanted to say something. Uh, I have a follow-up question for you, Megan. Um, you talked a lot about how, um, you know, you built sustainability into corporate processes and you have all these like really truly incredible plans um, and goals for the future. Um, but I was wondering how you can bring those goals and, and those ideas to, you know, not just um, what you're doing as a business, but also to your customers and the tourists. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I learned when jumping to the hospitality sector was I've never met more emotionally intelligent people in my lifetime, <laughs> right? These directors, they're tuned in to being able to empathize and understand needs of clients and understand how to communicate with them, understand how to storytell, understand how to create memorable experiences. And, uh, and when you combine that expertise with a little bit of guidance and saying, oh, well, you know, maybe let's talk about the local ecosystems or maybe let's talk about circular economy and the concept of not having waste anymore in these, in these sorts of facilities. And, and I think what's uh, most incredible is, is what we hope to, a really good vacation, it changes you, right? You learn something new in that destination, whether that be how you want to decorate your room or whether hopefully that be the kind of behaviors that you have that help you make progress towards climate change, make progress towards biodiversity um, protection. And what we hope too is that you can experience what one of those solutions feels like at an Iberostar star property so that you can go back and uh, recreate that in your own home or more importantly as well, when you go to other businesses, ask them to do the same sorts of things. I used to tell my colleagues, once you see a hotel room that is free of single use plastic, you can't go back. You see it everywhere. And you, and you end up in a room and you're like, why is there two plastic cups with plastic wrapping on top of it that I'm never you know, going to use that gets cleaned throughout services and, and those sorts of recognition, but then also action, right? Um, I think are a really critical part of how, how we want to convey that message by setting an example, showing that it is possible, that your perceived quality can actually be risen, it, was, it rises with sustainability as part of the solution and experience. Erin, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, so I wanted to follow up just to add, I think, uh, in the context of this conversation, one of the features that I also think Kind of to add to this is this concept of intergenerational diversity. So bringing it, it's exciting to think of this panel as being a component of that, bringing early career professionals and other youth into these conversations early on. And so that's actually something that we've been working on in the context of the ocean decade is figuring out how to actually bring earlier career voices into these processes. Um, and I think at least in my mind, this is especially key in thinking about the links between biodiversity, diversity in social institutions too, and then how do we actually bring that into these much more longer term processes and make them sustainable. So that was just another facet of uh, diversity and equity that I think is really important because sustainability ultimately relies on having voices throughout the entire career spectrum. Couldn't agree more. Juan? Um, I just wanted to build upon something Megan said about how hard it is sometimes to have these conversations with these communities. Um, and I think that underscores the importance of interdisciplinarity, of partnering with anthropologists, social scientists, people that know how to navigate those waters much better than us. And in terms of uh, how to solve that or how to, how to how to potentially address that, I think we, we have found it very helpful to actually uh, connect communities uh, that may be similar in many respects, but at the same time different. For example, there are a lot of communities in the, in the, South, in the South Pacific 
in the Pacific Islands that have for uh, decades used some sort of marine protected area in their customary fisheries management. So say you connected a group of those fishermen with a group of fishermen from uh, Peru that have never ever uh, um, you know heard about a marine protected area and then from fishermen to fishermen there is a much much better much better conversation and much just much more powerful. So I think as we can facilitate that, those types of uh, exchanges across cultures and across communities uh, that can just enrich uh, and, uh, and help us with this uh, diversity, equity, and social justice. It's something that was a, a theme that came up in everybody's conversation has been the importance of data science and also the amount of data and technology and how all those innovations um, right now can really put more information in our hands for us to be kind of smarter decision makers, understand our natural world better, and hopefully then be good stewards of it. So I'm gonna start with Ani, um, and just see if you wanna talk a little bit about kind of how you've tried to take all this data and try to use it to help people do decision making on it, and, and why you're looking at it at this like kind of new and different ways to look at this uh, marine biodiversity. Yeah, so, I, as I mentioned before, right, it's it's very hard to measure to measure biodiversity and like the way I'm I'm doing it currently using genetic methods from just water samples. Um, it's it's not the holy grail, uh, especially not because the really the technological development is in its infancy. Um, so currently, there's we don't have that much information uh, that we can get or we have a lot of information that we just don't understand I guess is the point. So we need to develop more databases and and get it more integrated into traditional methods um, right which which include kind of observations or dive surveys right you go out and actually count and look at uh, organisms and, and groups of organisms uh, to to make a more meaningful data set. So to me, to kind of get over that hump to make a maybe more meaningful um, measurement would be to get a better integration. And again, kind of interdisciplinary, but between different sciences um, as well to connect those together. I think that would really help me to further understand my data. Um, but the way that the way that we've tried to kind of connect this with people. Uh, was to get back to one of Erin's points that she made in the presentation of the essential ocean variables, uh, which basically are, uh, in short summary, uh, uh, an essential variable is, uh, is a measure for, for the health of the ecosystem. Um, and so we've tried to, uh, out of the, the genetic data for measuring the total biodiversity, we've tried to figure out if there are ways that we can somehow kind of tease out uh, specific organisms that uh, seem to be very important to, to that network of organisms uh, and that seem to somehow be driving that complexity and, and some of those interactions that we can see. But again, I mean, I think it's really in its infancy and it's really the first time it's really been trying to be done. So just helping with the technological advancements and understanding this data more, uh, integrating it with what basically all of the other panelists are saying on this panel and what they're doing, right, with people, uh, disciplines, maybe the tourist industry, right, if we can go out and collect more samples from different locations, different habitats, different types of ways, um, and more traditional methods of integration or measuring biodiversity, that would really, really be a great way forward uh, for for me or for, for the way that I'm measuring biodiversity, I think, and make a more meaningful data set that we can actually use, uh, for example, for essential ocean variables that we can measure. Great, Ami, I think Megan, you wanted to say something. I actually have a question for our data scientists. Perhaps this is for Ani, Aaron, and Juan. Um, I think you guys are laying out that the technology is advancing and that our understanding of analyzing that data can get us to solutions a lot faster. Wow, if there's one thing I've learned, private sector can move very, very quickly. And when harnessed correctly, that hopefully helps us to make decisions rapidly, especially in locations that are otherwise hard to access. So my question is, 
how close are we to real time information or real time management decisions that could come in response to an algal bloom, in response to a sargassum blow up, in response to a bleaching event, et cetera. You know, these technologies, how quickly would it be able to help us inform changes of practices on the ground? Juan, I, do you want to try to take that? And I think you also had a response to the other question too. Um, yeah, I can try to take that. So for my, my so I think that um, we are, as I said, at unprecedented times when it comes to ocean related data. And uh, in some aspects, we are already where you, uh, where you were just saying, we already have real or near real time data. Um, you know, think you, uh, if you go right now to globalfishingwatch.org, you can see fishing vessels as, you know, as early as, you know, 24 or 48 hours ago. And, you know, if, if, you, if you're an organization that uh, perhaps has a little bit of money, you can actually get that data with like an hour or two of delay. So we're really close to having that. And I'm sure other sensing instruments, uh, other technologies are also in a similar stage where you can really have that, that, that uh, velocity of data, if you will. Um, that being said, I wanted to make another a couple comments on, on just data science in general. And um, as Annie was mentioning, I just think data science, just the way it's evolving, it makes interdisciplinarity more important than ever. You know, the traditional ecologists or the traditional economists on their own, uh, they, don't, they just don't have the, the, the skills and the, and the capacity to really, really leverage the data. And on the other hand, uh, just a data scientist without the knowledge matter, the, the subject matter, and without uh, knowing what, what the actual topic at hand is, it's actually kind of dangerous. So it really makes it uh, more important than ever to really be as interdisciplinary as you, pos as you can possibly be uh, and really partner with people when, when you have a chance. Uh, and then my other comment was about um, just sharing with people. I think as data just becomes larger and more var var varied, uh, open science and open data is just fundamental. We really need to make them democratize access to data, uh, make it public, make it visually appealing, uh, easily accessible to people. Uh, for example, when you were dealing with artisanal fishing communities, uh, and there are some artisanal fishing communities that are willing to adopt some of these technologies like vessel tracking, because it, it empowers them, it gives them the data that they need to go and negotiate policies, to go and negotiate and sit down with governments and to prove that they're doing things right. So I think a lot, as we move towards this data science and this data revolution, we need to keep those two things uh, in mind. Well said, Erin? Yeah, following up on that, I definitely wanted the concept of open data and care data, making sure that it's the ethics are there is a really key piece and that definitely resonates with me. And also one of the things that we've been doing in the context of um, the Global Ocean Observing System and MBON is getting communities of practitioners together to agree on data standards. And that to me is a fundamental piece of actually this synthesis and integration that we've been talking about is having ways so that there's apples to apples, not apples to oranges, um, to actually bring those data together in meaningful ways. And Megan, to your question, I mean, I think in my mind, what I work towards and have really been passionate about is figuring out ways to do this ecosystem forecasting, trying to have predictions in similar ways to how we have weather predictions, building this integrated global system where we could know about all of the different species of organisms that we depend on. So yeah, I, I think it's a really timely topic and to move us from that raw data to this wisdom we need, this all of these facets are so important. Hey, Annie? So I, I echo what Erin just said. I mean, my work is, is I mean, kind of feeds into where we're, we're we're both working for the Amazon project and and to what she's saying to to integrate this data to do uh forecasting uh for like habitats is is really important i think that's kind of where my my data feeds into um but to answer megan's question i really feel that what um 
what you're saying is completely true. I mean, the private sector can be quick and a very, very good way for the public to make connections to nature and to get that connection to conservation and to understand biodiversity. So I think it's really essential. And it, it seems like what you guys are doing is really good in terms of um, habitat restoration and nature preservation. And I think that I think that these are just maybe certain different facets of the same problem that we're all trying to to tackle at the same time. So I'm kind of thinking um, that what I'm working on now and the technology is so rapidly developing that I do think that there will be a way to get a very quick response in like a, a live feed almost of, of how biodiversity is changing as soon as, you know, all the the, the lab work has been sorted out and we understand what the data means. Uh, but in the meantime, at least I think it can feed into um, trying to understand changes and maybe climate change issues um, on a global scale a bit better and maybe not on local scales such as on local coral reefs uh, and such. But, but I do think it's very important to to have all of them right and integrate them like we've all said so many times <laughs> i think thanks honey shana i'm going to give you the the last word on this one and then we'll have time for one more question all right um so speaking of data and also interdisciplinary subjects um one thing that i am a huge proponent of is uh solutions that kind of cross multiple benefits. So something like habitat restoration can um, protect coastal communities from storm surge, but you know, also plants vegetation that sequesters carbon. So it helps with climate change and with resilience at the same time. And you know, it has other secondary benefits like creating jobs and improving public health. But how difficult is it for one type of scientist, you know, say, um, an ecosystem specialist or, or an, a restoration engineer to talk to someone who works in public health, who might be able to bring in, you know, a coalition of people who are interested in health uh, to build these coalitions for um, solutions that protect biodiversity and have all these other benefits. I think there was a question there. <laughs> Um, and so anybody, I'm going to ask one question um, since we're out of time and if you want to also answer um, Shauna's question at the same time, that would be great. Um, and I think so Shauna's question was really about how, how difficult it is to bring in these different groups who often have different constituencies, talk different languages, and really make that interconnection. So that's that's one thing I think to the folks that are trying to do that type of work. And then my question um, as we end is, what is the one thing that you would ask people to do to make a difference to help us conserve biodiversity in our oceans and Great Lakes? So that's, that's my one question. And I'm just, for fairness, I'm just gonna go around in the order in which I see people. So Ani, I'm gonna actually start with you. So really putting me on the spot. Um, but I guess since I'm the first one, I can, I can kind of choose anything I want. <laughs> um, I, I do think that I really, there are so many things that I would like to say. So I would like to say as the most important thing, maybe try to read about biodiversity and what it actually means that it's decreasing or changing with environmental change. I think that's probably one of the, the most important thing to me. And then you can decide your own action after you've understood that issue maybe a little bit better um, based on, on the, the problems that are really facing this planet. Great, thank you. Megan. One of the main lessons that I've learned in doing this science in a surprising new setting is that 
more people can contribute to our solutions, whether that be climate change or biodiversity loss, than think they're experts in. In other words, you need not have a degree, you need not even have taken a class once about the topic. I think, as Ani is saying, read and learn. We are in an incredible age where this information is increasingly available, but also find ways that you can be a supporter and advocate for causes you believe in, whether in your purchasing power or how you vote or what it is that you um, want to do in your your community or also in your job and role as well um, and I think that's to, to me is a really big lesson is that everyone can contribute to these sorts of solutions in 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 really unique and interesting ways if you, if you give it some some challenging thought thanks Megan Erin so to add on to the learning and thinking about it I would also say the local, locally experience your natural surroundings. And as, we, as Shauna mentioned, I think one of the pieces I see about building these coalitions is building relationships with other people in maybe different sectors, maybe those that you don't even think would relate. I think in a lot of cases, we have these shared interests around food and security, the kind of basic human needs that we can develop these relationships around and in our local surroundings and our local communities. Thank you. Shala. I may be copying Megan's answer a little bit here, but I do want to reiterate that everyone has something that they can do. Um, you can vote, you can choose how you spend your money, um, you can create art if you're an artist, you can bring these issues to your book club or your church or, you know, whatever you are involved with, you can make a difference in that lane. So you don't have to be the superhero that saves the world, but if everybody does something and pitches in, maybe we really can tackle these issues. Thanks, Shana. Juan. Um, I think those are all great, great actions. But in my mind, the, the one thing that we can do that has the greatest impact would be to be very conscious about what we eat. I, fisheries, irresponsible fisheries continue to be the number one driver of biodiversity loss in the ocean. Um, so next time you go out to the supermarket and buy fish or you go to a restaurant and buy sushi, try to understand where that comes from support local fisheries if you can and yeah just be very cognizant of what you're buying and what you are supporting when you eat seafood thank you that's actually a really good to place to to end the importance of sustainable seafood if you eat seafood i just want to take a moment to thank all of you very much for participating on this panel um, when I hear what you have to say, and I know you're the emerging leaders that are going to be taking us into our future around conservation efforts in our oceans and Great Lakes and freshwater ecosystems, it just gives me so much um, happiness to know that um, we're putting our future in such wonderful hands. So thank you very much for taking time to participate at Capitol Hill Ocean Week, and I look forward to staying in touch, and I look forward to just watching your careers uh, continue to grow. Thank you very much. <laughs>